It happens that even though in source number nine, the Ramban teaches us, if creation is such a fundamental idea about defining who Hashem is, we would have expected that in the Aserat HaDibrot, Hashem would have identified Himself as such. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Asher Barati et HaShamayim ve'et HaAretz. Who am I? I am God who created the world. Isn't that the very first, you know, fundamental of faith 101? God is the creator. Isn't that how I've built Him up so far? And yet we read, no. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Asher Otseti Chamer Etzitzayim. I took you out of Egypt. Ramban says, don't worry. These ideas are integrally related, and we are going to get back to the Aserah that he brought in another context soon. Ramban says when you see Hashem acting in the world through the miracles of Yitziat Mitzrayim, Kiryat Yam Suf, how Hashem changed nature, where He showed His providence and His power, you come to the conclusion, says the Ramban, Gam Tore Al Achidush. If the world was eternal and God had not created it, there is no way that Hashem would have been able to change its nature in order to bring about all these great miracles. So what is the Torah's relation to creation? She was created first. She is present at creation. Hashem created a bearer, a carrier of His wisdom to enable us through the Torah to reach an understanding of our knowledge of Hashem, who He is, what He wants us to know about Him, what He expects from us, how He wants the world to operate. And to do so, we then realize, we then comprehend that the purpose in the world for us, our purpose, is as we learn in Pirkei Avot, to make His will our will. The Malbim in Source 12, and it's reiterated in Source 15, calls the Torah Chokmah El Yonah, the superior wisdom, the highest wisdom. Rabbeinu B'chaye ben Asher, a 13th century Spanish commentator who was greatly influenced by Nachmanides, by the Ramban, says, Kol ha-chokmot kulan michlalot ba. All of the wisdoms are included within the wisdom of the Torah. And that's why she's called in Tehillim Perek Yotet, Tmima. She is absolutely perfect. And in fact, the Ramban in Source Bet, in his introduction to the Torah, says, everything is learned from the Torah. In fact, Shlomo HaMelech learned all of his wisdom from the Torah. He even learned afilu kochot asavim usgulatam. He even learned the properties of the grasses, the wisdom of nature. So if the natural world is patterned after the principles of the Torah, because the world is built on the foundation of the Torah, and we said the world was created by chok, by laws of nature, then the Torah has to at least not conflict with all reliable, incontrovertible laws of science and nature that we know about. So in Source 16, we read a very interesting Gemara in Masechet Eruvin. Rabbi Meir, when he goes to Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Ishmael says, Rabbi Meir, my dear, what do you do? What's your career occupation? And Rabbi Meir says, I'm a lavlar, I am a scribe. So Rabbi Ishmael says to him, Bini, Top of page 3, source 16. Be very careful with your work. If you leave out one letter, or you add one letter, you destroy the whole world. That is a very onerous responsibility. So it's very interesting. Uh, the scientist, Svi Feyer, who wrote an English translation of Malbim's commentary. I highly recommend you look at it on Sefer Bereshit, using his scientific um, knowledge, and we'll see why I mentioned science in relation to Malbim in a little bit. He says the following. If the world is a complex set of laws and relationships which Hashem established, and the world is very finely balanced, then changing even one aspect of the world can throw everything into chaos. Now, if these laws are built on the Torah, then adding or deleting one letter, so to speak, will destroy the whole world. If we do so, we will destroy the whole interrelated structure of the world. As Dr. Fayer says, quote, change the magnitude 
of the electric charge of the electron or proton, there's my bio background, right? <laughs> By one part in 10 billion, the consequences are cosmic. We'll get back to this. You have to think a little now. I have to let this sit and di you need to digest this a little. I want to analyze this topic from a slightly different direction because now we are led to a very interesting paradox concerning the relationship between Torah and creation, especially with regard to the creation story in Bereshit, Perik Aleph, and Perik Bet. Because in Source 17, remember what we started this year with, with the question of Rabbi Yitzhak, right? Why did the Torah begin with the creation story? Ramban initially responds to Rabbi Yitzhak, and he says, why not? Isn't the creation story and the fact of creation a shoresh ha It is a dogmatic principle of faith. Why not begin with the very beginning? And if you don't believe, says the Ramban, in creation, and you believe that the world is eternal, you're a kofir ba'ikal, you're an absolutely horrible heretic. Ain't no Torah clown, you have no Torah. So Ramban says, why shouldn't we think that you start with the beginning? Ultimately, he answers in the third line of Source 17, where I bold-faced, Mipnei shemase bereshit sod amok, eno muvan min hamikaot. Ramban answers, when you open up and you read the first chap two chapters of Sefer Bereshit, do you really understand how the world was created in all of its detail and intricacies? You don't. The Torah, the story of creation, rather, is so esoteric, it's so cryptic, it's so obtuse, that only the elite can truly understand the secrets and mysteries of the creation process, and that was only understood, mipiha kabbalah, in this case he doesn't mean kab kabbalah, he means the oral mesorah that reaches back to Moshe Rabbeinu. So back and forth, the rabbinic sages argue, what are the parameters of allowance of learning of the creation story? What's very interesting is in source He, everyone agrees about one thing. The Torah, remember, she was created before the world was created. She knows what was, it's like I even struggled to say, what was there, some subsistent reality, some sub-reality. What was there before the creation of the world? She knows. But she's a good confidant. She's a really good student. And she holds her secrets in. You're not allowed to learn it. And she, and this Midrash actually quotes you a pasuk from Yov, which says you should only start expounding from the day of the creation of the human being on day six. The very end of the Midrash says, What you're allowed to learn, learn. But Shh, there are secrets. The Torah has so many of them. We know because she's the highest wisdom and incorporates all the wisdom. But that doesn't mean she's going to reveal her secrets so easily. And it also does not necessarily mean that a typical layperson should learn her secrets because it might lead you, chas shalom, in the wrong direction. Rabbi Rabbeinu B'chayeh in Source 19 says, wait a minute. And he was a, he was very, he was a great student of the Ramban. Ramban, im kol kavod lecha. You've emphasized the esoteric, cryptic, enigmatic aspects of Ma'aseh Bereshit of the creation story. But it's right here. Any child is going to open it up and immediately start reading the text. What are you going to tell them? Let's put a censor marks through it, blacken it. Chas shalom, it's in Torah Shabbat. So Rabbeinu B'chayi says, no, we need to rethink things. Because the creation story and the relationship of Torah to creation is not only found in the oral Torah and Torah Shabbat. So we, every lay person has to be able to learn something from these stories. And not just through that one statement in the Aserat HaDibrot, the Mitzvah Shabbat. Now it's interesting that Rabbeinu B'chayi quotes you in the first line of Source 19, the Pasuk from Tehillim, Kuf Yud Alef, Korach Masav Higid Le'amo, which might ring a bell because Rashi uses it in another context in the very first Rashi, the Chumash. But Rabbeinu B'chayi doesn't quote you the rest of the Pasuk. He only focuses on those four words. 
And he says the following. He says, also, applying the text from Mishlei, Kvod Elokim Haster Davar, Kvod Melachim Hakol Davar. Now let me summarize, I'll read a little bit of it inside with you. Kvod Elokim Haster Davar. The honor of God you should hide, says the Rabbeinu Bechaye. What should none of us ever expound upon, try to contemplate, think about? Hashem's, what he calls his mahut, his etzem, Hashem's essence, the essential nature. Who, who is God? We're not allowed to think about that. But koach ma'asav higid le'amo. We are allowed to expound on God's actions. Chvod melachim, when he acts as a king. Or especially, even or especially as the world is being created, that's what you should study and investigate and speculate. Meaning, says Rabbeinu B'chaye, Dafka, even though it's a schematic description of the creation of the world, the six days, very schematic, very, very formulaic, it's still, every lay person can glean very important fundamental concepts about God, that the world was created, that the world, that God, that there is providence over the world, that God takes an interest in the world. And even in the later stories, when Hashem commands the human being, he, he shows an emotional interest in finding a partner for him, and Ezer Kenegdo, there's the prohibition of eating from the Eitz Hadda'at, which means there's Hashkacha Pratit, there's the idea of reward and punishment. The fact that Hashem is even talking to a human being establishes the fundamental premise of Nivu'ah. And eventually from that we can learn the premise of Torah min hashamayim, of divine revelation. So therefore the Rabbeinu B'chaye says, I'll just read quickly one or two lines in source 19. We should learn about God's actions. If God didn't want us to know anything about how he created the world, he would have just said, poof, the world is here, let's move on. If he's describing a process, it's because he wants you to understand how the world was created in a way that we can relate to it, that we can understand that it is intricate, that it is a process, that it is very involved, that there is so much that we can appreciate about the genius and the wisdom of God the creator, and that means the genius and the wisdom that's been implanted within his product his artistic product, his creation, the world. What's really interesting is despite everything that I focused on with the esotericism of the creation story, even Ramban expounds on this story at length, despite all his warnings, from a philosophical perspective, from a Kabbalistic perspective, and even the Midrash Breshit Rabbah, which is the most complete of all the Midrash Rabbah compilations, analyzes the creation story every phrase. Wait a minute, I thought we have the rule, Ein Dol Shin from the Mishnah, you're not supposed to learn, what's the point? As scholars have pointed out, the commentators are warning, our sages are warning, in order to properly glean an understanding and knowledge of Hashem of, and his relation to the world, in light of heretical concepts that were circulating during their times, like for example Gnosticism and dualism, this obtuse enigma enigmatic story needs to have a guide for its reading. You have to learn it in a small group. You have to learn to read and interpret properly so you don't come to heretical ideas about Hashem Chas Shalom and how the world came into being. Breshit Rabbah, the Midrash, and our later medieval commentators who have pages and pages about this one chapter, the first or first two chapters, they provide us a guide for the proper reading of the creation story. Very quickly, I'll just expound on this. I'll do one or two examples by heart on page four in source 20. I won't read it inside, but I'll just summarize. For example, there's a Midrash that, that, that they're all arguing. When were the angels created? Are the angels mentioned in the first chapter of the creation story? No. So using other intertexts from other places in Tanakh, some sages say they were created on the second day, some on the fifth day, but they all agree. Hakol modim shelo nivra they were not created on the first day. Why not? Because otherwise you'll have the misimpression that one angel is pulling on the southern end of the firmament. Reminds me of like uh, the parachute they used to play with my kids. One, one angel is pulling on the firmament from the southern end. One angel is pulling on the, on the firmament from the northern end. And Hashem is in the middle holding it up. And they're all working together as partners in creation. Remember, the Torah seems to have been a partner in creation, but not 
the angels. Different ideas to think about. The philosopher Rabbi Gamliel in Source Bet says Hashem, he goes to Rabbi Gamliel, a philosopher goes to Rabbi Gamliel and he says, your God is a great artisan. He had a lot of artistic helpers and tools. He had the help of Tohu and Bohu and Choshech and Ruach. And Rabbi Gamliel says, okay, let's take a step back here. And he shows you various psukim where the verb bara is used relating to all of these so-called entities that they themselves are created entities. Rabbi Akiva in Source Gimel, he served uh, Nachum Ish Gimzo. It's really what his name is from his area of origin. We know him from Masechet Ta'ani, Daf Chaf Aleph, as Nachum Gamzu, because he used to say, Gamzu Litova. Okay. So Rabbi Akiva learns from him that the word et is usually an add on, it's a ribui, it's a superlative. So when you read, Bereshit Bara Elokim, et Hashemai, the et Ha'aretz, that's a little strange. If they're first being created, how could you refer to them with the definitive et ha? Et ha, those of us who know Hebrew grammar, the hey diaz, you're pointing to something that already exists and that you can identify. It should have said. Bereshit bara elokim shamayim ve'eretz. So the Midrash says, okay. Since there's no punctuation, what is somebody going to think? Bereshit bara elokim kama shamayim kama eretz kama. All three together, they created whatever came afterwards. So to separate it and make sure you don't have that misconception, there's the et ha. You can already see these are only a sampling of many, many midrashim that are trying to provide a proper way, a directed way to understand creation and the creation story and extrapolate it from it the correct lessons. Similarly, our commentators teach us that the symmetrical style, the tight structure of the creation story, its formulaic phrases, Hashem wrote this story with a purposeful style and design to emphasize the purposeful design for the creation of the world, to understand from this the structured, tightly organized description that the creation of the world is not haphazard and capricious whim, and a capricious whim that drove Hashem to create the world. There was much forethought, design, interest in every part of the world being integrally related, balanced, and interdependent on the other. Let's say the Big Bang Theory, scientifically, from the perspective of physics, is really true. What's the problem with it? The problem is that, it, they, that those scientists who adhere to the Big Bang Theory say, God, or some, something, not even God, right? Something happened and things banged together and well, poof, the world came into being. The problem with it is even if some of the principles of physics may be true and may be applicable, the problem is the entire underpinning. The underpinning is that the world just came into being because poof, things banged together and look what happened. That's what Hashem is dispelling through the tightly organized and structured story of creation. And Ramban describes that in Source 21 where he describes the usage of particular verbs. The verb bara is the verb that is used to understand that Hashem created something from nothing. What was before creation? Actually, Ramban answers you. Before the creation of the world, there was ayin. Of course, there was God. But in relation to the creation of the world, there was ayin. I don't even understand what that word means. Nothing. Nothing, nothingness. What does it even mean? Good question. But what we do know is that Hashem created the world, may I, and He created a yesh. And Ramban says, what was the first yesh? Here you see Aristotelian influence. Hashem created first matter. Of course, Aristotle didn't think first matter was created. He thought it was eternal. Okay, but nevertheless, Hashem created this first matter, which is really potentiality as such. It's like energy. You read in Ramban's writings, you almost feel like you're, you're, you're in a quantum physics class, okay? It, energy. And then from this energy, from this potentiality, everything else was created, yesh meyesh, something from something, in which case other verbs are used, yatsar, asa, in order to explain this, this very thematic, clear development. So in Source 22, so it leads us to another consideration in expounding the meaning of the creation story. Should one employ knowledge of science? To understand the creation story and others, should one read science into the Torah as a basis for parshanot? So look what the Malvim does in Source 22. This is in a footnote that he writes in the beginning of his commentary on Sefer Breshit. He started writing footnotes. The publisher said, if you keep going, we're not publishing. So he unfortunately stopped writing footnotes. So chaval. But the Malvim, okay, he's 1809 to 1879 in Eastern Europe. He warns us and he goes back to that same text. 
in Mishle Peret Chet, describing the Torah as Amon Pedagog. And he says, the Torah is Amon Pedagog. In this case, he's reading the Torah as a loyal student. The Torah holds many secrets, but she doesn't easily reveal them. And therefore, he says in the second line, HaTorah lo ba'a lelamed otanu inyanei atchuna v'chokmat ha'teva. You're not supposed to use the Torah as a science book. If you want to truly understand the scientific basis of the world and using the Torah as your science book, you're not understanding the true purpose of the Torah as a didactic, pedagogical, instructive text. Similarly, Shadal Shmuel David Lutzato, 1800 to 1865, Italy, he says... Yavinu amaskilim, if you're smart, you'll understand. Hamechuvan b'Torah e'na hoda'at ha'chokmot ha'tiviyot. The Torah is not meant to be a science book. Lo nitna Torah ele la'ishir b'nei adam b'derech tzaka u'mishvat. The Torah is supposed to teach you proper ethics, proper morals. What's really interesting is that while nevertheless, commentators like the Shada, and later on Rav Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, eschewed the approach of applying science to a read, to understanding the Torah itself. They did not un- want to apply their understanding of science, the creation story, especially in the 1800s, in light of some of the questionable science being promulgated with the development of the what? Darwinian evolution. Malvin was a little naive about that. And in light of the fact that Aristotelian science and Ptolemaic astronomy had already been debunked. And in fact, those scientific theories had formed the basis for some of Maimonides' analyses of biblical texts in his guide for the perplexed Moren Vuchim. So they didn't want to deal with it. Still in all, despite Malbim's warning in Source 22, he stands out as a 19th century commentator who was enamored by the new advances in science. And he felt if the Torah is what he calls Chochma El Yonah, the superior wisdom, and remember he's got in mind the Haskal of the Maskilim and the Reform Jews, he says it is incumbent upon a Torah scholar to demonstrate that not only does the Torah not contradict the true laws of nature discovered in his, these times, but these scientific ideas can even be applied to illuminate difficult aspects within the biblical text. So I have four more minutes, okay? So in Source 23, he uses a text from Shirat Chana. Ein kadosh kashem ki ein birtecha. The Ein Tzul Kelokenu. Now, most of us translate Ein Tzul Kelokenu. There is no rock like our God. Okay? Now we have to understand why God would be described as a rock. But Ramban says, uh, I'm sorry, Malbim says, don't read Tzul, read Yitzul, Creator. And I don't have time to read it inside, but, Ram, but Malbim says the following There is no creator or artisan like God. Think about it. We've been talking a lot about art, right? When an artist creates a piece of work, right, a painting, a pottery, once the work is finished, there's a disconnect between the artist and his or her product, right? They put it on the shelf, they want to sell it, or they want to hang it on the wall. If the artist goes back to her work, and she wants to work on this piece some more, this indicates it was never fully complete in the first place. So says the Malbim, Ein sul kelokenu, ein yitzlokein sul hayitzurim, God is a different kind of artist in relationship to his product, the world. Hashem created the world like a machine. And Ramban, and I'm sorry, I keep saying Ramban because he's always on my mind, but the Malbim um, uses the analogy of the machine. It was a typical analogy in his time. Those who were deists who were talking about that, that God may have created the world, but now it runs like a well-oiled machine and it just goes on its own, which means there's no idea of providence. You know, there were, there, there were Christian side, they were very orthodox scientists, even like Newton. They believed the world was created, but now it's on autopilot, says the Malbim, no. We say every day in our tefillah, before Shema, ha-mechadesh what? B'tuvo, b'chol yom, tamid, ma'aseh bereshit. What does that mean? Hashem has to keep Yachol, have to have his finger on the button every single minute to make sure the machine continues to operate. Nature to be sustained is a continuous creation. Every day Hashem is recreating the world. And that's what he emphasizes truthfully, that kiyum ha-teva hi matmetet. So if the world, go back to what we've talked about earlier in the Shia, if the world is dependent on the pillar 
the foundation, the cornerstone of Torah and mitzvot, then every single day, if the world is being recreated, then the world can't rely on the fact that we observed Torah and mitzvot yesterday or the day before. Every single day, the world is dependent on the observance of Torah and mitzvot because every day is a new creation. And every day, the world relies on the blueprint and foundation of the world, Torah and mitzvot, to continue to exist. So much so that the Malbim even says that there really isn't such a sharp dichotomy between miracle and nature. Nais and Teva, they're really two sides of the same coin. If you see in the last line of Source 23, he says, Hateva hu Nais matmid. Really, miracle is a greater, I'm sorry, nature is an even greater miracle than a miracle. Because nature is a miracle that's happening every single day. So therefore, in Source 24, I just want to point out to you, you can sort, study the sources on your own. The Malvim is amazing. And you should look at Fayer's English translation on Genesis because you feel like you're reading a science book of Malbim's commentary on, on, on the creation story. The Malbim coheres his understanding of Torah with the science of his day. And he proves the Torah incorporates this knowledge of science. For example, in the creation of light, we know day one, all was created. Day four, the mi'orot, the luminary. Sounds like a repetition of creation. So the Malbim says, let me give you a mini physics lesson. There are two theories of light. Newton said light is particles. Packages of photons. Christian Huygens said light is a wave. Today we really maintain both theories about light. Well, Malvin must have been prescient because he didn't make a decision either. And he says there's shitata nizila, the particle theory, and shitat ada, the wave theory. And even though the first light of day one does not emanate from the sun, because the luminaries were only luminous on day Nevertheless, says the Malvim, since it just says all, Hashem imparted the physical properties of light into this first light, whether it's a particle or a wave or both. In source bet on page 5, I'll just do one more source. He says, for example, or he talks about Sulam HaMadrigot. This is where some scholars think that the Malvim was, a, a, was a, an adherent to evolution. He's not saying that. He's saying that there is a deliberate sequence of progression. If you're talking about logic and structure, so you start with simple, and then you move on to complex. And what comes before prepares for what comes after. That does not mean that one thing evolved into another like Darwinian evolution presumes. And yet he claims that even though the Torah did not relate intermediate forms between the major forms of reality, domain, the inert object, someach, plant, high animals, medaber, human, he maintains we have to presume that the intermediate forms were created in between. He mentions the almog, the coral. He mentions the polyp, the sponge. These are intermediate forms between the plant and animal. He mentions the kof between animal and man. And he says, if there is a sequential progress, even though the story doesn't relate it in detail, that's how it must have happened. Not that one evolved into the other and from the other, but each intermediate form had to have been created in its proper sulam, in its proper steps. I want to end off with Tehilim Perak Yotet, which as you saw had been mentioned in various sources. This is David HaMelech's poetic description of the relationship between Torah and creation. And we say it every Shabbat, so I think it's worth spending one more minute on it. Hashamayim esaperim kevodker. The heavens testify to the existence of Hashem. But ein omer ve'ein dvarim. They are silent witnesses. The sun is singled out. The Hashem placed in them a tent for the sun who is like a groom coming forth from the chamber, like a hero eager to run his course. But then in Pasuk Chet, David HaMelech switches gears. We've been talking about nature until now. And then he switches gears very starkly. Torah Hashem Tmima, we know this pasuk, Meshivat Nafesh, we mentioned it earlier. Eidut Hashem Ne'emana, Machkimat Peti. The Torah is complete, it's perfect, it restores your soul. It's a loyal witness, it makes the uneducated smart with wisdom. The mitzvot of Hashem are clear and lucid. Mitzvat Hashem Bara, Mirat Enayim, they light up our eyes. So Parshanim, our commentators ask, what is the relationship between the first part of the Mizmol that talks about creation and nature and the second part of the Mizmol which talks about the Torah? So on the one hand we could say that these are two separate witnesses to Hashem's existence and to knowledge of Hashem. As the Rambam famously says in Source 26 in the Mishneh Torah, how do you come to love and fear God? Look 
around the world. Look around the world. Look at the world, says the Rambam, and find Hashem. When you understand the genius and the intricacies of the world, you will find Hashem. But in Source 27, the Ramban, in an essay which he titled Torah Hashem Tmima, and Rabbeinu Bechaye Ben Asher in a, the first Jewish encyclopedia called Kad HaKemach, it should be with a kaf, that's a typo, in chapter, the chapter on Torah say differently. They see a hierarchical preference being expounded upon in this Mizmor of Tehillim, a contrastive juxtaposition. That on the one hand, yes, you should look at the world. And says the Ramban, if you see the, the planets are orbiting, there's got to be a prime mover that's making sure that they're orbiting. There has to be a God. There has to be a creator. But then again, the more sure source of finding out the truth about Hashem and confirming Hashem as creator is in the Torah itself. Some individuals, unfortunately, look at the world and they don't find God. They even deny His existence. Philosophers sometimes speculate and look at the world and they, they don't conclude that, that there is a God or that there is a God who is providential. So says the Ramban, if you want to remove every suffix, every doubt from your heart, look at the Torah, that is the ultimate truth. Rabbeinu Bechaye in Source 27 Bed has a similar idea. That, there, that the, the Torah, you, know, you can play with it, Torah comes from the idea of Hora'a, instruction. Now just reverse the letters, Hora'a, He'ara. The Torah is, as one scholar calls it, the luminary par excellence. Look at the world first and appreciate the creator, but then the greater light that will illuminate our understanding of creation, of our role in the world, is the light of the Torah. That's why we say in the tefillot before Kriyat Shema, what, says the Rabbeinu Bechaye? First you say, Yotzer HaMe'orot. We talk about nature, right? Yotzer O, Yotzer HaMe'orot. And then the last bracha before Kriyat Shema is about what? Ve'ha'er e'neinu, light up our eyes, how? Betorah techa, through the Torah. Rabbi Yitzhak Arama, in the last, in Source 28, a 15th century commentator says no. The world, the creation of the world, the Torah, they are really one and the same. Ha'echad talui b'chavero, hu ha'difus elab, both. Not contrasting. He sees the two parts of the Mizmor as complementary with two E's, right? Reciprocal. Both are reciprocal witnesses to God's existence and His providence. One is an image, a reflection, a mirror of the other. Together, they both serve as proof for each other in order to gain knowledge of Hashem. Says Rabbi Yitzhak Arama, the world is the Torah. The Torah is the world. Find the light of the Torah in the physical, in the world itself. Look into the world and find the Torah. Look into, to, into the Torah and find the world, the purpose for which the world was created. So I want to end off with one of my favorite commentators, the Baal Sfat Emet, Rabbi Yehuda, Aryeh Leib Alter, uh, 19th century, uh, the Ger Rebbe. And he says, based on the Midrash, when the first light was hidden, according to Chazal, we all know that famous Midrash, that the light of day one was eventually hidden for the Tzadikim for the future. The Ger Rebbe asked, the Baal Satamet asked, what was this light that was hidden and where was it hidden? Is it only hidden for the future? So the Ger Rebbe says, no. He says, what's the light? The light is the Torah. Kiner mitzvah, another pasuk from Mishlei. Kiner mitzvah the Torah. Oh, Torah is light that we need to find. The light, the Hashem hid the light of the Torah in this world. Ganaz ha'or betoch ha'bria, nimtzeit he'arat ha'torah bechol ha'masin, motzi'in he'arot ha'torah toch ha'gashmiut. We have to find the light of the Torah even in the physicality of the world. We cannot see the world and the Torah as separate entities, but as one and the same. The goal is to raise up the world beyond the mundane. Find and look for the Torah, look for the presence of Hashem everywhere. Seek out the nexus between creation and the Torah. Thank you.